Welcome to June's Leco Challenge. Today's problem is k inverse pairs array. For an integer array nums, an inverse pair is a pair of integers i and j where i is less than j and nums i is greater than nums j. Now given two integers n and k, we turn the number of different arrays consisting of numbers 1 to n such that there are exactly k inverse pairs. So for instance, if we're given the array 1, 2, 3, we have exactly one permutation of this array that's going to have one uh, zero inverse pairs. So if we have zero inverse pairs, basically it's just going to be in order, 1, 2, 3. Notice how all the numbers are sorted in, asc in ascending order. Now with this n equals 3, if we're given a k of 1, then we're going to return 2 because we have three permutations that we can have. 1, 3, 2. Notice how 3 is greater than 2, and that's it. That's just the one pair. And here, 2 is greater than 1. Everything else is uh, greater than each other in order. So this exactly has two permutations that we can have that has one inverse pair. Okay, so the first brute force method would probably be to create an array with 1 to n and then find every possible permutation that we can have and then calculate the number of inverse pairs that we have and return however many we have that have exactly k numbers. But that's going to be super inefficient. One of the things we should realize is if we need to check how many inverse pairs there are, say, I don't know, one, two, three, something like that, we would have to check one and two, one and three, and two and three, right? Everything else we don't care about because we have to make sure that the i is less than j, and we're going to be checking if the number i is greater than number j. So one thing to note here is finding the number of inverse pairs is going to take... Uh, n squared time complexity. And specifically, actually, it's going to be n times n minus 1 divided by 2. And the reason for that is, first of all, it can't pair to it itself. It would have to pair um, to the ones greater than it. And if you think about that, that's just, that's just going to be n times n minus 1 divided by 2. right? So uh, that's one of the things we should realize, that the max k that we can have per n is going to be this formula here. So that's going to come in a little bit handy later. Now, finding every permutation is kind of out of the question because there's just too many numbers. So uh, to do that, it's just going to be really efficient. Surely there's some sort of recursive or dynamic programming solution here, right? And let's go through how we might do that. So say that we have a dynamic programming array that's going to consist of a two, uh, 2D array the k up here represents how many k's that we can have, and n is going to represent how many n's that we have. Now, the first thing to note is the very first row, when we have 0n, basically an empty array, all these are going to be 0, right? And, and we know that. Like, there's no way that we can have anything here other than 0 because we have no numbers. But what about if we only have uh, 0? We want 0 in inverse pairs. Remember at the first example here, we can see that it's in ascending order. There's only going to be one combination where everything's in ascending order. So all the answers to this, no matter what the array is, it's always going to be one. So here, like with this number, it's going to have just the number one. Well, obviously, that's just going to be one, right? Because there's no other way to do it. Um, but here with one, two, this would be what? Also one, right? Because it's only one ascending order. And here with one, two, three, there's only one. So that's kind of our base case that we can take care of. The first row with n equals 0 is all going to be zeros. And the first column, other than the first number, is all going to be ones. OK, so how could we use this DP array to start building up how many uh, numbers that we can have? So uh, first thing that we can calculate is what's the max number of k's that we can have per n? And we can have that using this function here. Now for 1, well, this is the only one that we can have. So everything else we can just count as 0. Now what about 2? Well, at 2, there's one way that we could do it. The max would be 2 times 1 divided by 2 is 1, right? So it can go up to 1 here. And this answer would here, if we have 1 inverse pair, is going to be just the reverse of that, right? And that's kind of an exception here. Uh, this would be 1. And we'll just have to mark that because it doesn't really fit into the rest of the algorithm. So we actually need to start at n equals 3. Now, at n equals 3, 
how many um, numbers are there, or how many arrays are there that we have one inverse pair? Well, from up here, we could take whatever we've calculated up with the uh, n minus one, where we have two one, and just add three here. Because as long as we know this number here is gonna be greater than all the numbers inside this array, so if we just add it to the end, it's gonna have the same number of inverse pairs here, right? So we can take this and put that in here. Now, what about the value here? Well, uh, what we can do is take our largest number, here it's gonna be three, and just shift it one. So we move our three right here like that, and that's gonna be uh, one inverse pair, right? So each time we increase the number of inverse pairs, we just need to shift our biggest number, like one. So basically we just take what's above us and what's what's to the left of us, and then we just add them together. So that's gonna be two. And here uh, with one inverse pair, what's the answer? It's gonna be, we have one, three, two, like I said, and then we have, you know, two, one, three from above. Okay, so now as we move on, what, what happens? Well, with two inverse pairs, it's uh, up here we got nothing, so uh, we can't bring anything from here, but we could shift everything um, here, right? We can move this three right here, and we can move the three right here. So here you can see we have two inverse pairs. We have two is greater than one, and three is greater than one, three is greater than two, and one is greater than um, three is greater than two. So three is greater than one and two. So that's two inverse pairs. So both of these numbers are valid. So up here, we don't, we can't bring anything from up here, but we could bring two from our left side. So we bring that over. But when we get to three inverse pairs, how many answers are there? Well, with three numbers, there's only one answer, right? It's gonna be three, two, one, where we have one, two, three. So that formula doesn't work anymore. And one of the things we can realize is once we hit n equals k, uh, some of these uh, arrays are going to be invalid. Like we can't shift this one. If we shifted, shifted it. There's just going to be a blank here, right? And that so that can't count. This one we can shift, but every but this one we can't. So where does this one come from? Well, it actually comes from up here, right? It comes from the one, two, three that we first calculated. So what we'll have to do is actually take um, subtract however num however many values we have from here all the way up to the left. And to calculate that, it's going to be just k minus uh, whatever value we're at n here. So what we'll do is add up right here. That's going to be 0. Add this from here. It's going to be 2. And we're going to subtract uh, k minus n, which is going to hit back all the way here and look up and subtract that value here. So that's going to be 1. So 0 plus 2 minus 1 is going to be 1. And we can see our answer is correct here. Now this is really confusing. Um, so I explained it pretty quickly. I would probably go over it just to kind of see what I mean. Hopefully it starts to make sense as I code it out. So let's let's begin. Let's start to code some of this out. Uh, one thing to note is we have to return a modulo because it could be a really huge number. So let's begin by, uh, just so I don't forget here, 10 to the ninth power plus seven. Okay, so <clears throat> I suppose the first thing we can have is, you know, if k equals zero, let's just return, what, zero immediately, or I'm sorry, return one, right? Because if k is zero, no inverse pairs, basically there's only one combination, which is gonna be that first descending order one. Um, so let's see, the first thing we'll do is create our DP array, which is gonna be a 2D uh, array here. First, with all values of zero, we're gonna multiply this by k plus one, and we'll do this for whatever in range of n plus one. Maybe I should bring my thing back. Uh, that's fine. All right, so uh, we have all zeros at first. Let's first set that first column all as ones, except for that first row, right? So to do that, I'll say four. Mm, I in range of n plus, well, starting at one to n plus one. We are going to just update our DP array with I zero is gonna equal one. Now remember how with the two n, when n equals two, it was kind of a weird situation there. So we'll just set that like automatically. Uh, we'll say, okay, DP uh, two, 
at one is just equal to one. Uh, that is, unless n is greater, unless n is less than, if n is less than two, then we can't do this, right? So we'll just actually just return uh, dpn k right here, because really it's just one of these base case answers then if, if n is less than two. But if it isn't, we'll set our second row here to equal one, uh, just make it simpler, and we'll say four. All right, I'm gonna call it nx. It's gonna be the row in, let's see, range of three to n plus one. And we'll say for kx in range of, uh, let's see, one to all the way up to, well, we, have to, we don't know what the maximum k is right now, so we need to calculate that. What's gonna be the maximum k? We'll call it mx, and this should be the minimum between k and that formula I mentioned, which will be, let's see, n times n minus one divided by two. All right, so up to the m, whatever the maximum here is. Let's set our DP array. So it's DP array nx kx is gonna be equal to up and down or up and left. So that's going to be dp nx minus 1 and kx minus 1. Oh, I'm sorry. This will be kx this will be plus dp of nx kx minus 1. All right. But remember, if it's that very, if it starts, if n is, I'm sorry, if k is equal to or greater than the n that we're calculating right now, then we actually need to subtract those invalid arrays that we can't shift anymore. Uh, so to do that, if, let's see, kx is greater or equal to nx, then we're going to subtract here. Let's subtract equal dp, uh, let's see, the nx minus 1, one row above, and kx minus nx. Now, finally, I believe all we need to do is return dpn k, but just make sure to take care of that modulo here. Now, where is it? Here, modulo. All right, let's see if this works. All right, um, let's try like some crazy number here, 100, 100. Okay, so I... Obviously, you didn't do this right. Let's look at our DP array, see what um, I did wrong here. Okay, so it actually looks like it's building up correctly. I may have, ac I may have accidentally added another. Oh, okay, okay. I need to add one here because I didn't get that end. So let's try that again. Yep, okay, there we go. So you can see our answer right there. You can see how big it is. So let's go ahead and submit this. And accepted. So time complexity is going to be n times k, as well as our space complexity, also n times k. Now, some of you might want be wondering, how did I come up with this solution? Well, I didn't. I don't... <laughs> I really think it's unrealistic for anyone to come up with this solution on the spot. I think it would take all day if you were to try to come up with this. Um, really, the best thing I could say here is if you can kind of guess that, yeah, there's a recursive solution here where we can make these into smaller problems and build it up, and surely there's some sort of dynamic programming solution, maybe you could kind of get here. I think the hardest part is this weird um, edge case where you have to subtract those invalid numbers where you can't shift. Um, but even if you can get up to this point, I think that's actually pretty impressive, uh, knowing that we have a 2D array where we we'll calculate the n and k and building that up. So honestly, I don't really have much advice as far as like how you can get here on the first try. I looked it up, I had to understand it, and even now I don't think I'm explaining that well, but um, 
you know, I guess that's just one of those things where you got to practice and hopefully these things start just getting uh, embedded into your skills and eventually you'll be able to like, you know, implement it with other problems. Yeah, so, you know, just when you think you know dynamic programming, you start getting these questions. Right, this one's hard, so don't feel bad if you cannot get it. All right, thanks for watching my channel. Remember, do not trust me. I know nothing. <laughs>